And speaking of um, astrology, say in its predictive or fortune telling aspect, it is generally looked at askance. But there is another side on which it has pertinence and value that has not been recognized in the modern revival and on which perhaps its most legitimate claim to consideration rests. This is its function as symbolic theology. Unquestionably, cosmic operation, cosmic significance lie behind the 12 constellations of the zodiac and the 36 or more other stellar configurations. The planisphere or chart of the heavens was doubtless the first of all Bibles pictorially edited. Not quite simply and directly, but intrinsically, all Bibles are amplifications and elaborations of the original volume of ideography first written on the open face of the sky, Excuse me. charted in the zodiac and heavenly maps, and later, later transferred to earth and written in scrolls, scrolls and parchments. Man was instructed to fashion his new body of spiritual glory after the patterns of things in the heavens, the heavenly or zodiacal man. And a graph of the structure and history of this celestial personage was sketched by the enlightened sages in the configurated star clusters. Zodiac comes from the Greek word zodion, meaning a, a small living image, signifying that it is a graph of the microcosmic life of man which is cast in the form of the macrocosmic life of the universe, or of God. Man's own small body is a replica of this body of God, made in its likeness and image. The vast frame of cosmic man was outlined in the scrolls of heaven, the solar systems and the galaxies being living cell clusters in his immense organism. So, we can see that our understanding of astrology, or the common understanding of astrology, has been reduced to uh, the mere, um, uh, like he said, what was the term he used? Fortune telling. But it held a great significance for those who understood. And uh, like mythology is a conveyor of information and knowledge, yes. Maybe within your presentation to come up, but I'm very curious in terms of why is Christianity so opposed to astrology, and they, they mm -hmm. call it dabble to yeah. a certain extent. Um, well, they have one or one or two um, <coughs> scriptures that they base their condemnation on, but as I'll point out later, Old Testament and the New Testament is filled with astrology, mm -hmm. and a lot of the enigmatic verses or concepts in it are explained once you understand that um, many of the uh, stories have an astrological base. And it, it isn't all, it's always like a, a power game, a political power game. The um, orthodoxy of the day holds a dim view of it. But it was not always like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when we show the video, they'll show that uh, um, in 1100, there was a picture that they uh, pull out that has uh, Jesus with in, in the center of an astrological chart. <laughs> um, this... <coughs> The story that the, the people of Kemet or the Remet understood is told the story of Asar, Aset, and many of the other Neturu. And later on, as Christianity developed, they seized upon certain aspects of that and transferred the understanding among certain Christians to mean that it was uh, the Zodiac was telling the story of Jesus, and that's the basis of this book. This came out in 18... It was originally written in 18... Um, 1893. Uh, 
with the witness of the stars by uh, Bullinger. And uh, I read this back in the uh, 80s, and I uh, I let someone borrow it, and you know, <laughs> never saw it again. <laughs> and I had to rebuy it recently. <laughs> but his whole thing is, you know, that's what he is, and he was considered, you know, uh, modern uh, Christian orthodoxy would have considered him a Christian mystic because he believed that, you know, the zodiac told the story of Jesus, right? So, but let's go forward. So I did, my point is, not all of Christianity has felt that way. And uh, that'll, that'll come, uh, come out as we uh, go forward, all right? All right, the bell of Saul. And you have to excuse me, uh, Baba Davis. I, I was struggling with that uh, J. Shesh uh, <laughs> program, and I, I wasn't able to figure out how you how you uh, put the white background on it and enlarged it. Uh, That's all right. But uh, looks good. <laughs> anyway, the belt of Sa. The belt of Sa or Sa is what we uh, norm uh, is the constellation that we normally uh, think of as uh, the Orion constellation. But to the remit of the, uh, the constellation of Sa, and this is a statement from um, uh, Graham Hancock in *Fingerprints of the Gods*. He said, "However, in examining uh, that diagram, he said the real surprise was revealed by Baval. I think Baval's name is Robert, but he's the same one that wrote the, the book, new book that's out, uh, *Black Genesis*. Mm -hmm. But he made this observation a few years ago. He said." By Baval's astronomical calculation was this, that despite the fact that some aspects of the Great Pyramid did relate astronomically to the Pyramid Age, the Giza monuments as a whole were so arranged as to provide a picture of the skies, not as they looked in the 4th Dynasty around 2500 BC, but as they looked and only as they had looked around the year 10,450 BC. So... Okay, so that so, was their perspective. Yes, now, so that raises the whole idea of what is the true age of, of the pyramid, when was it built, or is it, was it possible that if the pyramids were built around 2500 BCE, that um, it was, they were built in honor of a previous time. And uh, I guess some previous markers had been established in 10,000 BCE on which they erected the, py the pyramid. That's that's for us to speculate on at this point. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That timeline also yeah. seemed to fall closer to, to the timeline. The, the age the of the Sphinx. Right? Uh, of the Sphinx, exactly. Right. Because the Sphinx shows evidences of water erosion around the, 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 uh, the base. And the last time that area was underwater when it was a marshy was around 10,000 uh, BC. So it, our whole calculations may be off. Like I said, that's for us to speculate right, right. right now. But... Why do you call it speculation? Well, we don't know for sure. You know, I mean, I, I, I have my opinions, but I won't impose them on every, you know, everyone else. But your freedom, you know, Make your own judgment based on the not, the information. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so Psi, the Greek or oh, the Greek term for that constellation is Orion, and Psi meant the buried one, and it was the deified embodiment of the constellation Orion as a form of Wesir or Asar, as counterpart to Sopdet which was the, uh, the Greek, uh, the star known to the Greeks as Sothis or Sirius, and which meant, um, um, Sothis is uh, based on the root word Sophid, which means clever or uh, skilled, or so they, I believe they were drawing, saying that it was a feminine version of that, that's why they came up with the titled Skill Female. And that was in honor, or which is attributed to Asar's consort, Aset. Mm -hmm. And it was the, um, <coughs> um, 
the star that rose um, in the northern sky at a certain time of the year that signaled the inundation or the flooding of the Nile in which the, the Remets could plan their um, farming, planting and farming. And um, it usually occurred at the end of July and it also marked a new year and brought fresh water and soil nutrients from another for another growing season and so something that became the celestial marker for both the new year and the return of fertility to the land. The sighting of Sabdet was integral to the calculation of Kemet's calendrical system. Okay. So it wasn't just uh, just some fanciful uh, uh, fortune telling or whatever the opinion is towards yeah. astrology. It was involved in deep yeah. study. Yeah, and it was a way to that everyone could get could get in tune with. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, it was a knowledge or a pictorial pictorial uh, um, science or theology that everyone could have in uh, a mental picture of in order to start to plan and uh, for the society to thrive and survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for those of us who are interested in yeah. the calendar of festivals, this mm. would be the New Year festival. Uh, Subdip. The, the, um, the rise of, uh, of uh, uh, Sirius. Sirius, right. <coughs> Flashing in the sky. Right. And um, I'll go back to um, Dr. Obenga's book, where he pointed out that, that, uh, Sirius or Subdet was a binary system. It was two stars. One was visible and the other cycle again, uh, I'll incorporate uh, some of the uh, Dogon uh, information next time. Well, at a certain time of the year, because mm -hmm. of the wobbling of the current, current. Mm -hmm. uh, those stars actually go beneath the celestial horizon. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> some feel that that is the origin of the even stellar point of view mm -hmm. of this and Assembly also. Yeah. Because it then rises again. Ah, yes, I, I, I read something. Yep. Well, how would they know this if they couldn't see it? That's that's another. Uh, they could see those. Yeah. I'm talking about the yeah, one. That, that serious B. You wonder. Yeah. Right. But, but uh, I was referring to what you're looking at. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, you will also notice that there is a very interesting similarity between that illustration mm -hmm. and the carvings in which you see the king holding the enemies mm -hmm. of Kemet by hmm. their hair ah. and wielding a club mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as if to strike them. Mm -hmm. It looks just like that. So hmm. there is a possibility that that pose is really stellar mm -hmm. and not perfect. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you from time to time, in case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because now these, that pose is so familiar. Yeah. It is, you know? And most people misunderstand it. Yeah. They think it's, it's something having to do with a battle that was conducted during history and so on. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's, uh, it's the king in the pose of mm -hmm. the right. Yeah. Now, it, and it's interesting how, once this uh, narrative got in the hands of the Greeks, how they changed it, and uh, we'll, we'll see that in a second. But uh, I know in their terminology, Orion was a giant who, uh, mm -hmm. who, uh, seem to be oppressive and not the liberating Asara that we understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Were you going to tell us something about that line going on the top of that pyramid? Um, oh, now, this, this is the Great Pyramid. And the, um, I believe that is the star that it was, uh, we much believe that we ascended to after, uh, after we transitioned. Is it not? Yes. So, and so the Great Pyramid lines up with that, that one. So that would have been a launching, uh, I, I guess a spiritual launching pad. And also the, um, um, when, when I was in Kemet, uh, Brother Menu uh, observed that the, uh, it's long held that these were tombs, which they were not, but that they may have been, um, because the um, passageway is lined up with the view of where Sirius would rise, it was uh, thought that it was um, an observational um, um, what's the word I want to use? Observatory. Observatory, yes. Uh, used by the Remitch. So once that series came into view in that tunnel, then they could, uh, mark, you know, start uh, mark their calendar. So <coughs> that's uh, just incredible science and innovation at that period. It, 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 it boggles the mind to, to, to you know, try to appreciate, you know, how much they knew at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just uh, a sketch of the uh, the uh, Dendera uh, zodiac or ceiling. Now, the one that is in the temple in Dendera now is a copy because they took the original and took it to Europe, right? To So I'm, I'm, I'm still involved in the study and breaking down what uh, every, everything in the chart meant, so I won't get into that, but I will get into certain pe uh, pieces of it. Now, 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 there's a hippo at the center, yeah? The hippo is here, right? Yes, yes. And this is the foreleg of yes. um, the ox. And yes, the, and that, right. that foreleg uh, is like a stylus on a compass. Ah. It moves with the sky. Uh -huh. And uh, that is where we find the, what's, what we would call the north star. The, so wherever the hook is pointing would be true north? or Where the leg is pointing. Yeah. It's, it's part of the, the uh, <coughs> what's called the constellation of, uh, of uh, the leg of the bull, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> it's the little dipper, essentially, okay. at the center of the sky. Around which everything else goes. All right. Now, is that case? Is that a star, or is that another deity with the plume, hat, and the staff? Uh, here. Uh, yeah, below yeah. the bull. Is that a star? Oh. Um. Now, is that the? Is that the? Uh, is that um, the star constellation right here? Is this what this represents? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now you can see yeah. how, how when the Earth wobbles, mm -hmm. it, it would uh, seem to move, appear to move, uh, <coughs> down below the mm -hmm. perimeter of the zodiac. Okay. And then appear again, uh, assemble, so to speak. Okay. All right. Let's go on. Now, Yeah, <laughs> I, I, and I was I went to a few sites to try to make a um, 
a connection between some of the constellations that we understand today and what they had. And uh, I found a few, but uh, this one has a chart that um, it shows that it's been a progressive work and it's not really complete. But um, they um, uh, make a few uh, connections uh, between Septet, uh, Sa, Aret, which is the jaw. Yeah, connecting to the Hyades cluster, and so on and so forth. Um, some of the others. I'll, I'll give you the. Uh, I'll write down the uh, the website if you want to take a look at it on your own. But anyway, let me read this. It says uh, this is a statement from um, the Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly Palmer Hall, which was a uh, Masonic uh, document. But anyway, he made a statement saying, among certain of the Arabian or and Persian astronomers, the three stars forming the sword belt of Orion were called the Maji, who came to pay homage to the young sun god. Oh, left out a letter there. <laughs> and uh, the author, of, he states that the author of Mankind, Their Origin and Destiny, contributes the following additional information. In Cancer, which had risen to the meridian at midnight, is the constellation of the stable and the ass. The ancients called it Presepe Jovis. Jove, Jove or Jovis was another name for Zeus, who was originally called Amen Zeus in Greek uh, mythology. Uh, in the north, the stars of the bear are seen, called by the Arabians Martha and Mary, and also are seen the coffin of Lazarus. The fact that each, uh, and he mentioned the fact that each religion is based upon the secret doctrines of its predecessor. So, that goes back to our point that as we go through time, there's constant either stealing or borrowing and reinterpretation and re, uh, retelling the whole story until you, uh, you end up with that graining Xerox copy of the original. Now, in Job 9, it makes a statement that God, which, and see, this is, these are a couple examples that astrology is, uh, even though they, they condemn it, on one hand, it is through and through the Bible. It says, uh, in Job, it says, God, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. That's in Job 9, 9. And, uh, in Job 38, it says, Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his son? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Now, Maseroth is the Hebrew word for the zodiac. And so... For him to mention it that prominently, the Zodiac had to play a prominent role or place in their culture at that time. It, and it still does, but not out in the open. But anyway, let me uh, give you a little background on the ones that they're mentioning. Arcturus, <coughs> um, in, in Greek means the bear guard, and uh, was also called Alpha Butus, or Bootus. One of the five brightest stars in the night sky and the brightest of the northern constellation, Bootis. It lies at the, in an almost direct line with the tail of Ursa Major, or the Great Bear, and that's why it's called the Bear Guard. Um, Pleiades, which is the Greek for the Seven Sisters, and you know the oil companies <laughs> borrowed that, that title uh, for their little conglomerate. Um, in Greek myth, the seven daughters of the, t the titan Atlas and the Oceanid uh, Pleione had seven daughters, Maya, Electra, Tigeti, Seleno, Alci Alci Alcyone, uh, Sterope, and Merope. They all fell in love with gods except Merope who loved a mortal and were the mothers of gods. They eventually formed a constellation. One myth recounts that they, they all killed themselves out of grief over the death of their sisters, the Hyades, which is another uh, constellation which is 
corresponds to the jaw, the uh, erect. Um, another explains that, at, uh, this is interesting, that after seven years of being pursued by Orion, a Boadian giant, they were turned into stars by Zeus. Orion became a constellation too and continued to pursue the sisters across the sky. So that's a different perspective on, uh, on Orion's uh, or, or Asar's role. The uh, heliacal uh, or near dawn rising of the Pleiades in spring of the northern hemisphere and uh, has marked from ancient times the opening of seafaring and farming season. So they focus on a different um, constellation or star to signal their far, uh, the beginning of their farming season in, in Greece. As the more, also, as the morning setting of this group in autumn signified the season's end. So, uh, and some South American Indians use the same word for Pleiades and year. Or the constellation Pleiades and the, and the word for year is the same word. So we can see how not, not only among the Remetch, but worldwide and during that time, people marked um, um, the times of the seasons, times for planning by the constellations in the stars. And they had to be very observant in order to be accurate. Mm -hmm. right. Right. It must have taken several <laughs> generations to to observe, to observe and develop the um, yeah, you know, yeah. You've got to develop count systems, measurement right. systems. Like I said, it's been said that um, our concept of when civilized man began is uh, seriously off, and I think, like I said before, the the purpose of it, I think, centers. Uh, European man in the center of history rather than as a late arrival and that if you truly appreciate how long civilization has been on earth how long man man has been civilized and the sciences that were developed and all that it would reach back into antiquity you know yeah I think, I think you have yeah. to be correct so anyway um point you're making, uh, Manu says some of the same thing he talked about, and, he, and he's referring to Dr. Chancellor, mm -hmm. how stuff goes back basically to the Stone Ages. Mm -hmm. And how was it that we got so flim flam and, <laughs> and, 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 and can't get out of the flim flam? <laughs> I, mean, I just don't, sitting here, I just don't get it. But that's, that's a very, a very good question, yes. and, and that's going to be part of our concluding discussion if we can uh, get through the video in time. <laughs> That will be one of the questions. I'm, I'm going to give you room to explain it to us and help us <laughs> understand and see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, this is another uh, another verse from uh, the prophet Amos. It says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars which are the Pleiades and Orion and turneth the shadow of death into the morning and maketh the day dark with night that calleth the waters of the sea and poureth them upon the face of the earth. So that that uh, hints at or, or gives an indication of either an inundation or a flooding season that are connected with uh, those constellations. Um, and note that um, According to that chart that I have, uh, Menit, the mooring post, corresponds with the Butis constellation, which includes Arcturus, and then Hau, or the, Myri the Myriad, or the Flock, corresponds with the uh, Pleiades cluster. Okay, so... I, like I said, I just wanted to touch briefly on that. I'll let the video expand further of how um, the understanding and study of astrology was adapted, adopted, co-opted, changed, altered, 
and uh, given an entirely different view. So uh, let's watch that now. Um, and uh, how do I oh, expand this here? Is that what? Down in the corner. Is that the right one? Oh, you can do that too, yes. Okay. Okay, let's see. Hopefully with, you can hear it. As far back as 10,000 BC, can you hear that? With carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun will rise, bring vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood the crops would not grow and the life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, the, sun, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the twelve constellations represented places of travel for God's sun and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set. And Set was the personification of the darkness or the night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the Virgin Isis Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. At the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate in many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the Virgin Devaki, with a star in the east, signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and, upon his death, was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was a 
referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And, upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had 12 disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why twelve disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn a new savior. He was a child teacher at 12. At the age of 30, he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples, which he traveled about with before miracles, such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in the tomb, and after three days, was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which, on December 24th, aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. You know, Magi is this is why the word Three Kings magic. follow the star in the east magic. in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo is also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to House of Bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There is another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around the summer 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolize the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. But the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death, and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter. This is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the twelve disciples. They are simply the twelve constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. 
In fact, the number 12 is replete throughout the Bible. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac. This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross. For Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world the risen Savior, who will come again, as it does every morning, for the glory of God, who defends against the works of darkness, as he is born again every morning, and can be seen coming in the clouds, up in heaven, with his crown of thorns, or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures, there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur at a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150 year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares. And upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. <clears throat> Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Ares, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. <laughs> yeah. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the last Passover would be, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in, 
It always didn't make this any sense. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological <laughs> references. Uh -huh. The man uh -huh. bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. Hmm. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. Hmm. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3,500 years ago on the walls at the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth, and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration this is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. And the plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims at different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a Great Flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad, of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide, and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver, a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets, and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shalt not steal. I have not killed, became thou shalt not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shalt not bear false witness, and so forth. 
In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, When we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem as sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said, he was born of a virgin, except this in common with what you believe of Perseus. It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin had a solution. As far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. All right. This is the end of it. This is this last.
that sought to historize the Jesus figure for social control. In 325 AD in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established. And thus began a long history of religious bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for over the next 1,000 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe, leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. Christianity, along with all other related theologies, is an historical fraud. These religions now serve to detach the species from the natural world, and likewise each other. They support blind submission to authority. They reduce human responsibility to the effect that God controls everything, and in turn, awful crimes can be justified in the name of a divine pursuit. And, most critically, it empowers the political establishment who have been using the myth to manipulate and control societies. The religious myth is one of the most powerful devices ever created, and it serves as the psychological soil upon which other myths can flourish. <laughs> a myth is an idea that, while widely believed, is false. In a deeper sense, uh, in the religious this sense, this guy that's speaking is a, uh, a myth is a minister. serves as an orienting <laughs> Story for a people. Obviously, he's coming into a uh, deeper the understanding of not on the story's relation to reality, <laughs> but on its function. <laughs> a story cannot function unless it is believed to be true in the community or the nation. It is not a matter of debate. If some people have the bad taste to raise the question of the truth of the sacred story, the keepers of the faith do not enter into debate with them. They ignore them or denounce them as blasphemers. It is wrong, blasphemous, okay. and sinful for you to suggest, imply, or help mm -hmm. other people come to the conclusion that the U.S. government killed. Well, that's when he was being denounced because he uh, doubted the 9/11 uh, story. Which one? Wanted glasses? Yeah, that's the guy that was just speaking, David Ray Griffin. He he has uh, several books out about uh, disproving the uh, theory of uh, of what happened. He's that. the gentleman on the right. Yeah. Okay. So this goes on. Uh, it, it gets into 9-11 now. There's a few more chapters. Anyway. So what's the, um, the name of the name so we can go Of what? Of the, oh, the, oh, the, oh, I'll pass. This is a video. Is that guys? Oh, sorry. Oh, that yeah. guys? But this is the 2007 edition, but there's been a more recent one. So it's not on YouTube. It is. A, oh, it, it is, is. yes. I'm going to Amazon.com and buy wanted to say is that before we, we launch into the discussion with a few minutes we have left that this brings us up to date where we stand now but you have to understand that um, what has developed over the past couple of um, millennia is really intricate and has taken root in us and it is tied to our emotional um, and familial sentiments. And therefore, it makes it very difficult to um, right, and to take an objective approach, to stand outside of it and make an objective analysis of it. And it was like I was saying, and it's like uh, that invisible fence that they devised for the dogs that what has been established is a uh, system, a psychological system, where if you stray too far to the edges of your analysis and uh, objectivity, 
um, you know, those signals go off in you and cause you to recall and draw back and say, well, I can't go beyond that. Unless something really shakes you, you know, similar to my own experience where you have to uh, get by yourself, get quiet and take a, a cold, hard look at things. So, yeah. Yeah. my first question, how do you think the developments discussed in this class have affected African people as a whole, historically, economically, psychologically, socially, etc.? It's on a, it's a multi-level, uh, <laughs> it's a multi-level um, program that's been established. And uh, how is it, how do you think it has affected us? Differently from other people, or more more adversely than everyone, because it's it's meant for the for the entire uh, planet for uh, for the purposes of control. But how do you think it has affected us more so? Uh, what you had there in the first one, uh, each one of those had to do with Dr. Wilson's ISIS papers, mm -hmm. economically, psychologically, and socially white supremacy. Mm -hmm. She, she puts that in her book, the ISIS paper, about how that affects all of us in our daily living. But I, I, uh, my question is, how do you, um, how was the uh, an African narrative employed to promote and establish uh, white supremacy? Well, that's why I'm at Rose. <laughs> <laughs> so I discovered. I was deep in the Christian church as an officer as well as a participant in all the rituals. Yep. So, like we started out this making comment about Reverend Wright, uh -huh. I was in the same church, even at the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. Pretty this much is, all the time. How were you personally affected? Historic economic well, Personally affected, and I was a part of that, that belief system. And? Deeply involved in it. As a result? Did. Well, it didn't change me until I came to Jose and began to study. Before you came to Jose, how did that system impact you? Mm -hmm. That's well, the it question. Made, it really obviously, we were pretty ignorant mm -hmm. of what the real deal is. Mm -hmm. And once I saw Zagaskas, the first time I saw it was at the Parkway Theater about three years ago. But no, not about the film, but if I may, what did it do to you in terms of Preconditioning you to react in certain ways to events in your life. That's well, what I think. Is that what yeah. kind of person did it make you? Well, first of all, uh, with the study here, Rose, you begin to develop an understanding. Before Rose? Well, before Rose, I was a Christian, a deep Christian. So the idea of my belief system was based in what society's put in front of me. But to, let, to make you be confirmed. Let, let, me, let me give you a scenario. Yeah, yeah, um, maybe. Uh, we know, let's take the subject of slavery. That's the physical bondage of African people. I'm talking in particular. There's many, been many uh, slavery systems, but in particular, the African slave system, and it, which was begun by Arabs in Eastern Africa who were Muslims, supposedly devout people. And then a few hundred years later, the Europeans seized upon what was going on there and saw the opportunity and established uh, slavery on the West Coast. And part and parcel to that was that the fact that the uh, church or the Pope had to give consent for any nation that wanted to engage in slavery. So, how did, just focused on that, how, how do you think that affected African people? It was, it was used to, to ensure that they had um, power and control mm -hmm. and to ensure this in this country when they use it um, if they would put the Bible out and say you, need, you should do this because this is what it says you, you should do it and be. They use it, they clearly use it to, to keep you down, mm -hmm. to keep us in a, in a position of uh, them having control and power. I can just look at um, my life as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And I never felt that something in me never understood that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I went, 
I just went. You know, I was, it was just ingrained Sunday, this choir rehearsal, this rehearsal, this, yeah. that, this. And something in me knew that that just was not what I was, I was supposed to be doing. So, so and as soon as I got away from it, I never went back. So, the people that have, like, like you, like me, like everyone else, there's this persistent paradoxes that exist in our uh, psyches and subconsciouses that says that, you know, this message that is being tacitly communicated to me that this is supposed to be my lot in life. I'm not supposed to rise above this. I'm not supposed to uh, do any more than this or what society tells me I to do. How does that, you know, affect the stability of our uh, of our minds, yeah. It just makes it more Because yeah. I knew the message wasn't yeah. my message. Yeah. I just did, and for a long time I didn't know why. Yeah. I think it's kind of funny how it's almost like they digested our our mm -hmm. our spirituality mm -hmm. regurgitating back to us. But it's just like so mm -hmm. It's and the thing is is I'm still learning and there's still some things about Christianity that mm -hmm. I really loved. Mm -hmm. I loved coming together and, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I grew up in a predominantly black church that right. my family yeah. had, took part in starting and yeah. um, they were members of the council and so mm -hmm. it was a lot of joy in going and but at the same time, so it was, it was very sentimental. I, I know I could still hear um, so, so older, not not just new stuff, but older gospel songs that still affect me emotionally. And, and, you know, but we have to. Uh, we have to. Um, look at those feelings, objective, in light of the knowledge that we've come into, and not um, and realize that some of. A lot, like I said, those songs that I appreciate are out of a heartfelt love for divinity. And uh, if I look at it in that context, you know, it removes some of the contradictions, even though I, I can dismiss, you know, a lot of the other stuff. But, you know, um, um, I, worship I, and praise, you know. I, I think that what's um, interesting about it is when we got Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, it, when we got Christianity here in America, it, we weren't able to educate ourselves. So right. we, and not even be able to use some of our own culture. So the one thing I do think, because I want to, I would like to see, I see the good and the bad, because mm -hmm. there's so much sentiment connected to mm -hmm. it, is that the things that were kept were, that I think are beautiful, are the art of it, mm -hmm. um, the, the oral tradition. Yeah. The the um, the song you know the the the, the praise and worship the, mm -hmm. the dance I mean mm -hmm. you know that's kind of bastardized yeah. but at the same time it's just it is a spirit in it it's just ignorance yeah it's, and that's and, it's know, a mixture it's not completely one thing mm -hmm. or another it's a conglomeration of things happening at once and that makes it hard to uh, like they like the Bible says to rightly divide the word of truth. And I know one thing I remember coming from another coming from another class, I was always taught, oh, walk by faith. Mm -hmm. And when I remember what triggered something for me was walk by knowledge. And that's mm -hmm. something that's not taught yeah. in, in Christian church. Mm -hmm. Even when you know you think you're learning theology, you're mm -hmm. not really learning theology, you're yeah. learning something else. Yeah. Doctor, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. I guess my question and I don't know enough knowledge about it. Um, you know, I know how we were, how our spirituality and, and the traditions were, you know, somewhat stripped from us, we were prevented from practicing our original traditions, mm -hmm. and, you know, told that it was cake and told that it was bad, mm -hmm. you know, this book is, you know, the book, and this is what's right, and this is what you should believe in, True. and this is, this is what you do, and that's what was done with African people. And I don't know if that was done to the same degree, you know, with Asians, East Indians, other people. I know Christianity was introduced to them, but I don't think the denigration of their beliefs was to the degree that it was for African people. And I think that has, um, has uh, you know, some.
has to do with why a lot of us are still holding on so strongly to Christianity and won't think of any other belief system, won't think mm -hmm. about any, mm -hmm. you know, going back to our own nation. Mm -hmm. video goes, uh, if we are to take a core statement that what was being revered was the sun, mm -hmm. and only observations of nature right. constitute the truth, right. and everything else is myth, right. and that would include African myth. Mm -hmm. I know. But, so, so yeah, the people, even when we get... Mm -hmm beneath the European, uh, right. what's called a patina. Patina is that green the, the color that, yeah. that, that brass mm -hmm. and copper takes yeah. that, that creates a surface yeah. that some people love yeah. and others want to rub off. <laughs> but even after you rub off the surface patina, mm -hmm. we're then left with African mm -hmm. mythological systems. Mm -hmm. And the same statement applies to them. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I meant to give up. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. one could, uh, this implies mm. that these stories were created to serve a certain function. <coughs> and according to the video, mm. they were serving the interests of the elite of the society at that time. So one would then say, what the Europeans done has been done before. Yes. All they're doing is copying the technique yeah. of taking the sun or nature yeah. and imposing mm -hmm. a deity in their image mm -hmm. so that the impact of teaching us yes. to believe this yeah. is that we associate white people with God. Yeah. And to disobey God mm -hmm. <laughs> is a sin. Ergo, to disobey whites, yeah. include, especially whites who have who are in power plantations, governments, whatever, is actu actually to commit a, a, a religious crime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are conditioned then to be obedient to our oppressors. Mm -hmm. Now, but that's, that technique, this video is saying, has been repeated historically over and over and over again from age to age to age to age. Mm -hmm. Now, so it goes very, very, that message goes very, very deep beyond just the question of white supremacy. If we believe this mm -hmm. statement, this core statement, yeah. then all religions yeah. serve the elite's interest. All of them. Now, then we ask the question, is there something real <laughs> that these stories actually are trying to personify, represent, allegorize, uh, that is worthy of our faith and our practice. That's the question it raises for me. Yeah. So if you, if you really take this yeah. seriously, yeah. then we should be questioning, it would seem to me we would question, you know what we're doing here. Uh, because any form of organized religion, this video implies, is false. Uh, and the system of spiritual Belief and practice are also organized. Otherwise, they're just individualistic, and they're not. They're shared mm -hmm. systems of belief and practice. So even systems of spirituality that are associated with, that have in them mm -hmm. stories of a deity or, or of a, mm -hmm. a reawakening, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. are also false. Yeah. This, this is very... Yeah. Yeah, uh, very deep yeah. and very uh, could be very spiritual. Yeah, if you take it literally. And uh, I'm, uh, I thank you for that. I overlooked because I intended to uh, give a uh, qualifying statement before I showed it that it was from a European atheistic standpoint. They were taking the knowledge and formulating their opin opinions, and I, I meant to uh, to uh, state that, but. Uh, but we, but there's a lot we could take take from it, from you know, just from them presenting uh, the research, and they, and they show also demonstrate a a, a lack of understanding of yeah. the, uh, the uh, yeah, African spirit. Yeah.
Yeah. So, you know, my comment on Thank you for that. Sure. Yeah. On your, on your topic here is, uh, I think it's, it's absolutely <clears throat> important to have uh, some form of religion and spirituality for purposes of control. You know, you have large numbers of people, you have to have some method of controlling them mm -hmm. other than just having, having the government. Mm -hmm. For African people, right now, are very psychologically traumatized mm -hmm. by the experience mm -hmm. of slavery mm -hmm. and the seemingly disconnected and contradiction within, within Christianity. Mm -hmm. I think what we take away from this class in terms mm -hmm. of our understanding of spirituality mm -hmm. is that many of the reasons and justifications for us being here are validated. Mm -hmm. That the collection of, of, of those of us that, that, that found our way outside of organized religion mm -hmm. and, and, and gathered here mm -hmm. in search of something beyond that, in search of, of new truths. And we all seem to have a certain kind of um, uh, uh, desire, a certain kind of drive, never feeling comfortable within the realms of Christianity yeah. and, and, and Islam. Uh, and and so this validates yeah. our stepping outside of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it validates our I, 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 I work and our mm -hmm. efforts here at the World State Community. Yeah. And um, one thing I wanted to say is that I, I believe uh, God has endowed African people with a unique insight and sensitivity to spirit. And, but we have been programmed, conditioned to subordinate our insight, our perception to other people's uh, perception. And um, going back to what happened to Christianity, if you went back to the core of it, you could see something that would have been familiar to us and would have been, we could have really identified with. But since it was uh, mixed with what a society that Europeans envisioned with them at the top and, and employed for, the, for those purposes, it, 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 like I said, it had to, uh, it compelled us to subordinate what we saw or what we felt as being evil. And I, I'll give an example of something that happened before I came out of uh, Christian church. It happened over 20 years ago. I was going to a church in Los Angeles that um, was trying to get into the notoriety of a lot of the TV ministries and all of that, and uh, they were, you know, had a lot of celebrities going there. And one evening, they, we were having a service, and this huge traveling bus pulled up, and it was a group of these uh, white ministers who got out, and musicians. And I guess they had contacted the minister and requested to uh, make a presentation, which they welcomed, they got out, and the whole gist of their presentation of singing was to tell us that black people's methods of worshiping, of singing and worshiping was all wrong. It had too much rhythm in it, too much wildness and primitive um, elements in it, and that they were there to show us how to uh, do it properly so that it would be acceptable to God because the way we were doing it, it was not acceptable to God. And it was one of the most, you know, it was one of those shaking experiences right. in you that, uh, you know, many of us, you know, just had to leave in the middle of the, the presentation. To, uh, yeah. The thing is, that's wrong, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. In my heart. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible has taken craving that all people have mm -hmm. uh, to feel connected mm -hmm. uh, divine power mm -hmm. beyond itself mm -hmm. and twist it mm -hmm. to serve their own purpose and name. So when I said, is there something real, mm -hmm. aside from all of this, mm -hmm. I, was, I was trying to, that was an arrow, mm -hmm. <laughs> pointing to what happens when someone becomes aware of a personal mm -hmm. relationship with mm -hmm. something 
sacred mm -hmm. and powerful in their lives, mm -hmm. uh, for which they don't have control. Mm -hmm. And that has happened since the beginning yeah. of humankind. Uh, we still harbor that, that, that response, mm -hmm. which is a natural mm -hmm. response to being overwhelmed yeah. uh, and, and united with mm -hmm. and this force. Mm -hmm. See? But we've been taught to condemn it. Mm -hmm. That response, mm -hmm. um, and even today, mm -hmm. it's being condemned mm -hmm. as, as you say, criminals. Mm -hmm. But it also turns out to be that we're living in a period where white people are leaving the church, mm -hmm. exactly, in yeah. droves, yeah. because yeah. they become aware of this, mm -hmm. uh, and they they feel that they've been betrayed mm -hmm. by the church. Mm -hmm. They're looking for something more personal, mm -hmm. more therapeutic. Mm -hmm more individualistic, that does not depend on the, the uh, intercession of a priest yeah. or a minister and so on, something mm -hmm. as direct. It reminds me very much of the Gnostic mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. uh, as they were, in fact, after the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They found themselves adrift. Yeah. How could this happen to, to the house of God, right? God's people. And they look for a direct connection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're looking for, too. Okay. Yeah. And in this time, mm -hmm. maybe uh, we're passing into the age of direct knowledge. Yeah, yeah I, I had a point, but you, uh, you go, go ahead first, because uh, I have to, uh, I lost it there for a second. Go yeah, ahead. I guess I want to have a question to add to the question. Uh, in terms of African people mm -hmm. and the development, um, we have from the class gotten um, some excellent analysis and assessment mm -hmm. of how the ancient understandings were brought forth and altered or mm -hmm. changed to suit different mm -hmm. groups. But I still want to know how uh, ancient knowledge mm -hmm. has worked its way into African, mm -hmm. sub-Saharan mm -hmm. spirituality. Mm -hmm. I really would like to know how the Dogon people yeah, have interpreted that, yeah. how the Yorubas have interpreted that, how the Shona mm -hmm. have interpreted that, uh, um, even the Bailey. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very, very critical to my understanding and development. And, and like I said, we we'll, we'll go through the class mm -hmm. again. That's uh, something that I, um, I'm already working on, in, incorporating uh, more of that into the uh, into the class. I, I, um, I had an analysis of what the Dogons were teaching, but I decided to wait wait on that. But uh, but oh, uh, back to Baba Ray's comment. I think one of the things. Mm -hmm that people are searching for or see what's lacking in, uh, in uh, the modern religious experience, first of all, is that it's too constraining and finding and you have too, uh, you, it's like you have an overseer over telling you, you know, you can do this and that, can't do that. And I think they're looking for a spirituality that has more freedom and invests more within the individual to navigate their way through and respond to, like you said, the um, those, those cravings that you have for connection, mm -hmm. for, um, mm -hmm. for those impulses that um, that you personally have and, and, and um, perceptions that you, you know, you experience and, mm -hmm. and and, and 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 pursuing those and following up and developing them within yourself. And I think the spirituality, any spirituality that we want to go forward in, has to involve that 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 uh, that you are the person that uh, has to be the navigator. You can take messages, guidance, advice, and uh, insight from others, but you have to be the final one to go forward. Yeah. I'd like to say that this class has served its purpose in terms of what you came here for. Mm -hmm. The idea 
but my father was a Baptist minister in Detroit and Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. He scared me to death because he was a sanctified preacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was about the age of 14. Mm -hmm. He scared me to death. <laughs> but I really enjoyed the church. Like Sister here said, Sunday was an event for me to go to church, to get dressed up, mm -hmm. to go there and to socialize with people with the same ideas, the same consciousness. Same as we both say, the same consciousness we have here. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons that I love coming mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Because we all are almost on the same page. But this particular class brings us to the summary of what it is why we're here. Mm -hmm. And what it is we have been lacking in the knowledge of ourselves. So the bottom line is that when we discover who we are, such as I have, by through Brother Ray and Michael Lisi and a few others, being here and studying and doing the research, because this is a, this. DVD actually serves as a resource element to tell us. I, I think that's, that, that was the key word. It's, it's a resource, not, not uh, and it we begins should, should with the get idea of yeah. clearing out the cobwebs of, yeah. of uh, being tricked or being brainwashed mm -hmm. to believe in somebody else's way. Because my family from Eritrea, they told me, we don't believe that Christianity in America. Because they're Coptic Christians, they know the resources, such as the story of a saw in the set. They used that as their, when they were growing up, that was like the little tale they were told, being children. Okay. But the Coptic Church has priests that still tell them what to believe out of the Bible, and why they kiss the Bible when they do their rituals every Sunday morning. But think about all the other African Americans who are right now at this moment in the Christian Church who are just so wiped out in terms of the knowledge of self. Yeah. It, it's behooving to me. I guess that's why we don't want to get in arguments with them because it's very much a contrary thing okay. to them. Okay, we got we got to wind up. I just uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask Shango something, then I'll let you have uh, yeah, uh, Shango. I was I was looking forward to uh, your uh, <laughs> <laughs> questions and perceptions, though mm -hmm. you know su summarizes. Mm -hmm. Me, brother Amy. Mm -hmm. right. My thing was more so. I was sitting back in one of my political science classes back at Howard University, and my mind was, I'm not sure, was it Karl Marx or was it Engel, who said, in essence, religion is the opiate of the masses. That was one of the things that was shouting. The other part of it is that I recommend strongly a book I'm reading right now, about halfway through, and a lot of what we're talking about here mm -hmm. and the background information on um, why we in the USA mm -hmm. got so destroyed mm -hmm. because it was more whites here mm -hmm. than us. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Caribbean and South America, mm -hmm. it was far more numbers, <laughs> numbers, numbers of made them, a difference. so they were able to retain case. more. Hmm. And that message got real clear to me reading Oba to Shaka, a return to the African mother principle. Yeah. That book is profound. Yeah. A lot of things we talk about here mm -hmm. is right in that book. Okay. It's just Okay. I'll stand. That's Wind it up for us so we can Yeah. Uh, well, just quickly. Yeah. Uh, one could leave this class today thinking of all of the stories are uh, 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 not worth yeah, I did, anything. I, did, I didn't want to get that impression. One could. Yeah. Since yeah. they're false, then yeah. of what value yeah. is it to understand them? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the answer to that question is as long as they empower us to navigate, yes. uh, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, our own spiritual mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. uh, they serve a good purpose. purpose. Right. So you should always ask that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does this narrative empower mm -hmm. me to be my own minister? Right. Yeah. Exactly. If the yeah. answer is it doesn't, yeah. then put it aside. There you go. If it does, yeah. embrace it. Embrace it. And like I said, the, the opinions of the people that produce the video, um, we can lay aside. But uh, I showed it for the purposes of bringing forth the history and the knowledge of how things were appropriated or changed. And that was a... Um, and they did a, a, visual, a, a good visual presentation on that point, but on the other part, on the other side of it, I wholeheartedly agree. And let that be the final word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. And so the next uh, session well, you're going to.
Well, I, I don't know if we'll uh, take a year off and then start start it from uh, cycle one and work through it again, you know, with some adaptations and, you know, like you said, go into more depth on um, sub-Saharan uh, African religion, uh, spirituality. Yes. I, I think there's an implication here in this question. Is yes. it possible to alter the schedule for so that some things are moved up or replaced? Or is that? Or yes. We could go yes. into this follow-up step by step, like we could get a sampling of. It would mean redoing the whole thing, which, <laughs> yeah. as you know, is quite a Yeah, that yeah. would be very difficult have, at this that's point. That's why I'm saying you don't have to redo the whole thing, yeah. but just May, give but you know what? assessments. Like I said, Baba Jahi um, has to make a change in um, the schedule for the summer schedule, because he won't be here. So, may, uh, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe the other thing is the and his interest has been expressed by yeah. the organization. Yeah. We've had uh, discussions yeah. formed to pursue yeah. uh, that hmm. need. So, but it always depends on the availability of the facility. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and who facilitated it before? Well, I have. Mm -hmm. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your schedule was? Well, it depends. I mean, so we, we don't have discussion. We have to look at what would be the topic, how many details are going to be sold. But the cake is available during the week for an hour, hour and a half. We could just create a special group on a special topic. And that wouldn't affect the schedule. So, how do we follow up from what you just said? <laughs> you, you talk to Let me, uh, I think we need to have some meditation and try to uh, figure out how that can be possible. How, how can that work? And I'd have to see. We'd have to see. And decide on what what um, what would be the, you know, the whole outline of what the, the discussions that would take place. In the past, it's always been the responsibility of the person who came up with the idea yeah. to recruit.